welcome everyone. This is our first boot camp. Uh, I think this is the first time we've we've done anything like this. So this is, you know, this is meant to be relatively informal. Um, if 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 you can only join for pieces of it, that's perfectly fine. Um, and come and go as you please. You know, the the general order of things is that I will, on average, spend about half the time uh, giving PowerPoint slides, just giving you know all the gory details you could want about about anything with Python. Uh, zoning in on a particular topic each day. Uh, and then the final half will be exercises that I've put together to uh, to see what we just talked about in action. So, you know, uh, one day, you know, one day we may be talking about, say, object-oriented programming. We'll be talking about that in detail next week. Uh, and then there are some exercises that we'll spend the latter half of, of those sessions on uh, just so that you guys can can actually write a little bit of code and actually see what it feels like to uh, to write object oriented code in, in Python. Uh, the exercises we won't necessarily do all of them every day. Uh, we we will do what we need in order to, uh, in order for everyone to get a good understanding, and then the rest will basically just be up to you uh, at your own discretion. If you feel like you need more exercises, they are there. And uh, and you can use them, and there are solutions posted. So I will post quick a link in the chat. All of the slides and exercises and their solutions are in the Git repository. That is the link I just dropped uh, in the chat. Uh, we'll go over uh, later in this session. We'll talk about how you can can download those. And that will essentially require usage of the terminal, which we will go over today, um, unless you, uh, I'm not sure if there's a way to download them from, from within the browser, but there's a really easy way to do it in the terminal. So it'll be a good, uh, kind of a good exercise today to review the terminal and then show you how you can download these slides directly to your computer uh, using that. If, uh, uh, just to reiterate some of what came up in Astro Coffee today, uh, the, the focus of this boot camp is, is on the SERP students. Um, you know, everyone is welcome to, to ask whatever questions they have. If you, know, if you have a, a burning question or a clarification, you know, don't hesitate to interrupt me. Um, I, I, would want, I would rather be interrupted as I'm going through slides uh, than, than to, you know, bring something back up while we're going through exercises. So don't hesitate to just simply speak up. Um, you can also post questions in the chat, um, you know, however you feel like, uh, however you feel comfortable getting my attention, uh, please do so. Don't hesitate to, to bring something up. Let's see, I think, uh, I guess one, one more thing before we get started. Um, the, like I said, the focus will remain on the SERP students. So if, if there is ever anything that you feel like we you maybe need uh, some more time on, if if the if the students want to spend uh, some more time ta uh, with lecture slides or more exercises on any particular topic, we will do so. Uh, and and the direction that we take uh, that we take this will always be essentially driven by uh, the SERP students' understanding of what we're doing. If if you're not a SERP student and you have questions or and you have more questions on a particular topic, you can always uh, you can always email email me. I'm happy to go through something uh, more in depth with you one on one. But these sessions are mostly geared for uh, for the undergrads who are just starting out. So without further ado, let's get moving on the uh, on the slides. Let me just share my PowerPoint screen quick. All right. Okay, so I've never shared PowerPoint over Zoom before. So is everyone just seeing this introduction? We're seeing like, presentation mode or presenter you're, mode. You're seeing presenter mode, okay. Let's see. Uh, in that case, I think, how about now? We're just seeing the slide, you're good. Just the slide? Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. Um, so, 
Once again, I'm James Johnson. Welcome to our uh, to our boot camp. So b- before we dive in, I want to say uh, hello and introduce myself. So I am a third or fourth year, depending on what your quality what your qualification of a third or fourth year is. I just finished my, the third academic year, so uh, I'll leave it up to you if you if if you say that that I am still a fourth year until this fall. Or or sorry, if I'm still a third year until this fall, or if I'm now a fourth year because the third academic year is over, um, whatever that fits in your book, that's that's the label you can attach to me. I work primarily on uh, galactic archaeology from a theoretical standpoint. So those of you who are doing projects with Jennifer or Fiorenzo Vincenzo, I heard their names a few times at Astro Coffee this morning. Uh, I overlap with them a lot. David uh, David Weinberg is my primary advisor, but uh, we have very similar interests with Jennifer and Fiorenzo, so we overlap a lot. I've done some work in the past on uh, dark matter halos and how they spin and spatially cluster. That's mostly with collaborators at other institutions, though. I have a, have a chat. Ah, yeah. So, Hannah, yeah, if you're working with, with Dr. Vincenzo, you will uh, you, you'll probably see me uh, see a lot of me over the course of the summer. Um, as far as what I've done in insofar as just a pure software development in Python standpoint, my my Python package is the Versatile Integrator for Chemical Evolution, or Vice for short, which is on GitHub and is publicly available. And as of last week, was ringing in just a few hundred lines below sixty thousand lines of code in part Python and part C. Uh, so that to say, you know, I can, I'm capable of teaching you guys everything up to and including a large package design for Python, uh, as well as writing C extensions. Uh, but you know, we won't be going that far with, the, with this bootcamp. This is more of a basics than a uh, Python for software engineers bootcamp. And like I said earlier, we'll be doing a mix of slides and exercises, but I'm not going to be grading anything. You know, whether or not a whether or not you have a correct solution to an exercise will be pretty apparent based on uh, the nature of the problem that I've given you, and just whether or not your code works and replicates the aspects of a correct solution. So that said, whatever whatever you get out of this bootcamp is going to reflect what you put into it. So. If you uh, if you put in a lot of effort, you will learn a lot. Uh, if you if you don't put in a lot of effort, you you won't learn a lot. But you also didn't put in uh, you also didn't lose a lot of time or effort. So uh, you only you only stand to gain from what we're going to be going through here. Moving on, I sent out a survey, which uh, I believe all of you responded to, and thank you for doing so. The first question was about everyone's uh, current capabilities in Python. And the, for the most part, the general uh, census was that all of you have coded, maybe not necessarily in Python, there are a few of you who have experience in other languages, but everyone has coded before. And most of you have written some of your own code, be it for a class or for research before. Excuse me. Um, and for the most part, uh, you all said that you were you were comfortable with some of the basics of just general program control, like if and else, for while, uh, def, uh, some of the other goodies, built-in functions with uh, with Python, the basics of functional programming, more or less. Uh, the the third question was about whether or not you've written a class in Python, and that was a reference to Classes in the sense of object-oriented programming, not uh, not classes as in courses uh, at, at uh, in school. About half of you said yes. Um, the rest of you said either no or what's that. Uh, so we will be covering in depth, uh, in actually very gory detail, how to write Python classes because that is actually how you do object-oriented programming. The next question was on importing code and usage of, of code that is maybe not in the file you are currently writing. And that is done with import statements. 
Um, so about half of you said that you've done that before. Uh, for those of you that haven't, we're going to be going over that. A current plan is to uh, is to talk about that on Friday. And going along with that, we're also going to discuss how to uh, spread code out across many files, as well as importing and running entire directories to essentially create uh, Python packages, more or less. It's much simpler than it sounds. You just have to put a bunch of import statements into a file with a very specific name. Uh, and then you have yourself a, uh, a nice small Python package that you can uh, use and maintain. Question five was about GitHub or Bitbucket or some of the other equivalents, which for the most part are just online uh, repositories where you can store and manage code and do uh, what people usually refer to as version control. Which, uh, which is just a means of managing code where you know, not necessarily just the present version is, is relevant. In, in large production scale packages like NumPy or SciPy or Matplotlib, they're not just interested in the current stable, um, currently publicly available version of the code, but they're, they also have several versions in development. And, and all of those versions are interesting and Things like GitHub and Bitbucket let you switch back and forth between them very easily. We won't be doing anything of of that uh, of that caliber, but nonetheless, if we have some time at the end, uh, it can be useful to uh, to see GitHub and Bitbucket and show how you can set up a simple repository, uh, even just to manage code between multiple computers. Like I I for one have uh, have this desktop in my apartment, a laptop, and my computer in the department. So GitHub is very useful for me just in terms of managing code and having a master copy that I can use to, uh, to mediate all the different versions between each of my computers. The sixth question was about notebooks versus text files uh, or some mix thereof. This is a question primarily about the medium in which you write code. If, if you haven't written code in a notebook or if you don't know what this is, uh, it's just a, uh, an application which lets you write Python code more or less in chunks and then run each of those chunks individually. They're, they're very useful because you can write small pieces of code and then inspect their output and, uh, and, and debug those lines and then and then move on and you do what you will with them. The, the answers to this question were fairly binary in that pretty much everyone was either all notebooks or, uh, or all text files and with not much in between. Uh, so if, if you have written entirely in notebooks, a little bit of a spoiler alert, um, I'm going to uh, ask that, that you get comfortable with a text editor or writing code in text files. And we'll talk more about this as we, as we go on, but the idea is that text files are, are much more flexible. Notebooks are somewhat restrictive. Uh, and we'll talk about why, but you know, most people write, you know, most astronomers at least, uh, write a lot of code in notebooks. So if, if you are a notebook programmer, uh, this is a good opportunity to kind of break out of that shell and get comfortable with a tool that is going to uh, take you much farther in the long run if you decide that you're going to build something of, of substantial size uh, or you decide just simply that you want to organize some of your code. I personally use, uh, use notebooks somewhat sparingly, but I do use them. Uh, but for the most part, I write in text files. I find that they're uh, that they're extremely powerful for importing a library that I have built in a text file and then just playing around with it in a notebook and uh, things like making plots is is really nice uh, in notebooks because you can just you know write the body of the code and then mess around with the small piece that produces your your figure. But you know that said, given where everyone is at in skill level here, uh, most of what we're going to be doing here needs to be done in text files. Uh, and, uh, and so we will come back to this in just a second when, uh, uh, when we talk about some of the tools that we need. 
The final question was about whether or not you have used a terminal or a command line. Some of you have uh, have never used it, which is fine. It's uh, it's relatively easy to pick up, and we're not going to need any any particularly advanced uh, shell scripting for this boot camp. But uh, but nonetheless, uh, terminal usage is relatively important in really any in really any field. Uh, so now is a good time to uh, to pick it up and uh, and use uh, and figure out how to use a terminal. Uh, there's a question in the chat about um, using an IDE. Uh, I will con I will compare an IDE with a text editor in just a minute. So I will put a pin in in that question and come back to it in just a second. Uh, you in in short, you can use an IDE if you want to. Uh, but the the bottom line is that IDEs and text editors differ just barely. Um, IDEs will suffice if you decide to use one. Uh, but I'll come back to that and tell you what the difference is in just a minute. So in summary, what is new material to pretty much everyone in here is how to import your code from elsewhere in your computer. Uh, those of you that have imported code from other files, I didn't ask whether or not you had imported code that was in a different directory or, uh, or how to uh, set up a directory structure to put Python package into. Uh, but uh, for the most part, we will start from the beginning uh, with just a file that you import that is in the same directory, and then we will work up the ladder to, uh, to spreading code out into multiple files and subsequently importing some directory. Um, Object-oriented programming, there was some experience, you guys said you had some experience with this, but, uh, uh, but I didn't ask about things like inheritance or composition. Um, these are just advanced, uh, advanced applications of object-oriented programming, which we will get to next week. Uh, if we get to it, we'll talk about GitHub and Bitbucket, some of the equivalents. Um, I use GitHub. Uh, Bitbucket is probably the second most popular next to GitHub insofar as platforms to put your code onto. Uh, but uh, I don't know I don't know if we will have time to get to to this. I would rather focus on Python and the specifics of coding in Python rather than, uh, rather than places where you can just simply put Python. So this is more of an if we get to it deal, if, if it turns out to be something that, uh, that you as the students particularly want to talk about, we can. Uh, if not, no big deal. Um, it's, uh, it's just sort of there as something to cover if there is interest and time. Uh, so this, this note here uh, is really the impetus for using text files or an IDE over your uh, over your notebooks. The basic idea being that if you are going to set up a small Python package, um, you cannot do that with notebooks, or at least not without taking extra steps to complicate things relatively significantly. Um, classes as well are more or less uh, are difficult in notebooks. You can use them, but if you're going to set up a relatively complicated class. It's just easier to do this in a text file. And there's a question in the chat now about text files on Windows 10. Um, there is uh, there is really no difference that I'm aware of between Mac and Windows. You just need uh, one of the applications, which I'm going to talk about uh, here in a second. So the the overall procedure for using text files should go uh, about the same as what I'll be talking about here. So text editors, as I mentioned earlier, they differ from an integrated development environment or an IDE in one relatively key way. And that way is that the IDEs will run your code for you. And they usually come with, uh, with a line-by-line -line Python interpreter like IPython or just a Python shell. Um, so you, you, you can use an IDE if you want to. If you're comfortable with an IDE, by all means, stick with it. Um, they fulfill the purpose of, of what we're looking for, which is just text files. Uh, uh, and to clarify by a text file, if you have ever written 
a uh, a file with a .py extension that is a tech, a Python text file. Uh, no one may you know that people may not have phrased it that way in the past, but uh, but that is what you are doing. Some of the popular IDEs out there are PyCharm and Spider. Um, Spider, I believe, uh, comes with Anaconda. There's also one known as IDLE, which is, I believe, the Python Foundation's own IDE. Uh, so, it's, you know, the bottom line here is that uh, you'll need a text editor. It doesn't have to be any particular text editor, and it can be an IDE if you want to use an IDE. Uh, but if if you've never coded in uh, in a uh, in text files or .py files before. And and you're not really sure which way uh, which way to go. My my personal favorite is uh, is Sublime Text. This is the program I write my code in. One advantage of a text editor like Sublime over uh, over say PyCharm or Spider is IDEs are often dedicated to a specific language. So if you expand your programming capabilities at any point beyond Python. Uh, you might find that suddenly your IDE doesn't work for you. Uh, so this is just something worth uh, worth considering, and and you should think about uh, what what best fits uh, your needs as uh, as an astronomer and as a programmer, uh, rather than what anyone else uh, what anyone else uses or recommends. Just ask yourselves, uh, you know, how how do I how do I write code? Uh, what what tools do I like? And uh, and that may be an IDE, that may be a text file. Uh, that is up to you. Uh, the bottom line is just you need a platform on which you can write .py files. If that's Sublime, if that's PyCharm, if that's Spider, that's fine. Um, the next tool that you will need is a, uh, a terminal or some equivalent thereof. Uh, if you, if, for those of you who have never used a terminal, um, just think of this as you're learning it, like a slightly different interface on your Finder window. Um, the basics of a terminal is that it runs line by line commands, and I'll be going, uh, you know, I'll be going back through the terminal specifically and discussing um, essentially the basic usage of, of the terminal. That's what we're going to be going over today. So, uh, so don't focus too much on specifics of the terminal right now. We'll be coming to this in a minute. Um, if you are using a Mac, there is a built-in terminal app, uh, though I personally prefer uh, the replacement, which is this uh, iTerm2 application. That's what the link here is, uh, is to. Uh, it's, it runs just like a terminal, but you can customize your user interface a little, uh, a little more easily, and there's some wider range of customization. Otherwise, it's the same. Uh, so. Uh, you know, you choose whether or not you use Terminal or iTerm2. Uh, Windows users, uh, Terminal is a little complicated for you because the Windows terminal is not the same as the Mac or Linux terminal. Uh, we'll be coming back to this in a minute, but uh, but if you if you are a Windows user, uh, I encourage you to reach out to me uh, later this afternoon and uh, and. If you if you would like help, I can help you set up a Mac or Linux like terminal on Windows. It is it is possible. There are just a few steps you have to take. Uh, so that's that's the topic of of, of this slide. Uh, some of the exercises that we're going to be going through kind of presume a Mac or Linux like terminal. Uh, so if you're if you're a Windows user and are fairly new to the terminal, um, just don't hesitate to reach out to me and uh, and have me help you kind of get that set up. An additional tool that you have, we won't be using this in the bootcamp, but just to let you know that it is there and it is an option uh, if you so choose to use it. Uh, I think those of you who have taken 1221 or 3350 will recognize this pretty, uh, it should be pretty familiar. SciServer is, uh, is just one example of a cloud computing platform. Uh, the difference between cloud computing versus non-cloud computing is just simply that 
uh, in which computer is running your code. Like if I go and make an account on SciServer and launch Python, it will usually be in a notebook, uh, but uh, the notebook itself is being ran by SciServer's server as opposed to your computer. Your computer is not doing the brunt work. It is the remote website's server, which is actually executing the code and is just sending the interface and the output back to you. That's, that's what cloud computing means. Uh, the bottom line to all of this is, you know, completely regardless of the bootcamp, you should choose to work with tools you are most comfortable with. You know, we're, we'll be working mostly with, with text files or if you so choose an IDE and a terminal here. But uh, in the long run, if you like notebooks, work with notebooks. If you like text files, Work with, text, uh, work with text files. The, the bottom line is just do what you need to do to be the most efficient programmer and the most efficient scientist. So if you haven't already, um, you will want to get Python. Today, today we will not be talking about Python specifically. I, that is by design. Uh, we'll be starting the Python uh, the quick and dirty review of Python syntax uh, and its and its aspects and details on Wednesday. That is, like I said, by design so that everyone has uh, a day or two to really get comfortable with the tools that we'll be working with and make sure that everything is downloaded and uh, and working properly uh, before we before we dive into the really gory details. So, uh, if you uh, aren't sure yet if you have Python. Um, I am pretty sure that Python comes pre-installed on pretty much every computer nowadays. But um, but if you've never done so, um, a it's likely that that the pre-installed version is in need of an update. So the easiest way to do that is to just go to this link here uh, on anaconda.com, and that will install Python. Anaconda and Jupyter Notebooks along with it. Um, I'm pretty sure that comes with Spider, the uh, um, Anaconda's IDE as well. Um, Anaconda, if and again, if you're if you're completely new to Python, uh, Anaconda is just a collection of third-party libraries which are very very popular. Um, you will you will undoubtedly encounter them, especially in STEM fields, things like. NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib, uh, Pandas. Uh, this, it's a very long list. These are just uh, external libraries which people have developed and put together uh, for others to install and subsequently use. And, uh, and we'll be talking pretty in depth about Anaconda and some of the things that you can do with it on Friday. The latest version of Python uh, is, is 3.8.2. Most of the libraries nowadays uh, use 3.5. Uh, and Python 2.7, although it is a, uh, although it is, or rather was, king for years in terms of the go-to scientific computing language, uh, the Python Foundation has deprecated uh, all versions of Python 2. So what that means is that Python itself, the people who developed Python, no longer support Python 2.7. So if you've been using Python 2.7, uh, it has been deprecated for a few months now. I believe it was January 1 of this year. If not, it was January 1 of last year when, uh, when Python 2 was officially uh, retired and, uh, and they no, no longer offer support for code in Python 2. So if you need to update Python, um, go to this website, and, uh, and I believe this should take you straight to the download page uh, for the latest version. Uh, so sometime between today and tomorrow, uh, you should do that if, if, uh, if you think you need to, and, uh, and then you will have the Python version that you need for what we're going to be talking about here. So the other resources, uh, these are also linked on the, on the Git repository. Uh, there is, uh, just to 
circle back quick. There's a quick question in the chat about a preferred version. Uh, there is no preferred version as long as you are using Python 3. Uh, nothing we're going to be talking about here is going to get into any of the uh, very nitty gritty details between Python 3.5 versus 3.6, 3.7, 3.8. Um, everything we'll be talking about is uh, is compatible with all of those versions as long as it's just Python 3. Point something. Uh, so some of these other resources, like I said, there is uh, there is the Python Foundation's Beginner's Guide. Um, that is, you know, the Python Foundation. Those are the folks who developed Python. So uh, their Getting Started Guide is a pretty good place to start if if you're fairly new or just need a refresher. Uh, Learn Python is a site which uh, which actually I personally used when I was learning Python. There is an app for the iPad and the iPhone as well. It's a pretty quick and dirty way to learn the syntax and just uh, and just get it running. Uh, you know, if if you're the type of, of developer that has coded before but don't necessarily know the syntax of Python, this is a pretty good place to start, uh, and I recommend it to most people. Code Academy is also very highly renowned. They are well known for very in-depth, very effective course tools uh, that are free and open source, but nonetheless, there is a pro version uh, for Code Academy that you can purchase if you so choose. Um, but the bottom line to all of this is that there are plenty of resources out there to supplement what we're gonna be doing here, uh, so that if there is anything that you feel is, is shaky in your knowledge, uh, there are not only my lecture slides and my exercises, but plenty of other resources out there uh, for you to go and look for help on this. So in summary, uh, our goals here, just in general over the next two weeks, uh, we'll be talking about the basics of how to use a terminal. Uh, that's mostly what we're going to be talking about today. And, uh, and then on Wednesday, we're going to do a real quick and dirty review of the basics of Python. And this is gonna include uh, control structures, conditions, loops, uh, the different data types, functions. So the keywords that you actually write into Python uh, to maybe jog your memory if that doesn't, uh, if you're not familiar with these words are if, elif, else, or, while, def, list, tuple, uh, dict, uh, things. Uh, if those words ring a bell, uh, that's what we're going to be talking about on on Wednesday. Uh, on Friday, we'll be talking about Anaconda and how to read documentation. Uh, you know, Anaconda, like I said, is just a collection of external libraries, and one way to teach it would be to talk about every single element of its contents and every single function. But that is. Uh, in all honesty, a very poor way to teach how to use Anaconda. A much more effective way is to teach people how to read Python documentation, uh, because then when the question comes up, how do I, uh, how do I use this function? Uh, the documentation is all more or less in the same format between every package. Uh, and if you know how to read documentation effectively, uh, just by the nature of your question, you know where to go find the answer within the documentation. Uh, so we'll be talking about that, and there will be exercises on Friday uh, going over how to plot in Matplotlib, who's, uh, and Matplotlib is a package whose uh, documentation is somewhat notoriously convoluted. There are about five different ways to do one given thing in Matplotlib. So uh, so we'll be using that as kind of a test bed to really hone our skills with uh, with reading Python documentation. And also on Friday, then that's when we're going to talk about how to spread your code out across several files. There won't be much that is new to Python on Friday, uh, but some of the skills that we learn uh, that day are pretty effective and uh, and pivotal in terms of moving forward if you decide to build anything of substantial size, being able to read documentation is imperative. Uh, the second week is, is uh, pretty much reserved for a deep dive into object-oriented programming. 
this is essentially how you make new objects. And we'll be talking about objects uh, in, in a second here as well. That's going to come up in the next uh, slide at a very or in the next uh, few sets of slides uh, at a very abstract level and what we really mean when we say an object. And inheritance and composition may not mean anything right now, uh, but the idea is that hopefully by Wednesday of next week, it does. And you know how to implement that. Um, inheritance and composition are extremely powerful tools. And you may find that a you know, many hundred or few thousand line code that you have written in the past may actually become much, much simpler uh, once you know how to do things like inheritance and composition. I have found that often the most powerful uses of object-oriented programming are the ones which have just only an you know, of order 10 to 20 line class uh, to organize your data. And, uh, and even just, you know, in some cases, even just a small object with only a few lines of implementation uh, can drastically shorten a Python script. Uh, the idea is not about coding more, the idea is about coding better. And, uh, and I have found that in learning some of these advanced aspects of Python, I actually write less code that does more. Uh, and uh, whereas functional programming in a language like Python can only take you so far. Uh, if we have time and if, and if there is interest, I can uh, talk about some of the basic uh, software engineering principles that go into building something of a substantial size. Uh, and these are mostly just boiled down to good habits. You know, if, if you're going to build a Python package, you, if you decide that that's how you want to organize your code, uh, there, are, there are good ways to do it and there are bad ways to do it. And they may all work, but especially if your code starts to get big, uh, the bad ways to write a code can only hurt you as the developer. Uh, so these are things that are worth learning if you're gonna go farther in this. Uh, other things we can cover, like I said, uh, if, if there is interest, if there is time, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, Git, which is a command line tool for GitHub and Bitbucket. Um, this, these help with version control, general organization of your code. Uh, another thing which you guys might find useful is how to write just a very simple make file. Uh, I mean, literally like five to 10 lines of, uh, of a specific program, which is a different language than Python. Make file syntax, is, it is a different language, uh, but, uh, but it is uh, very useful and setting up a simple make file can actually automate some day-to-day uh, some -day tasks, uh, which you may find, uh, may find useful. So that is the end of this set of slides. So. I want to stop here and ask if there are any uh, questions, any comments, concerns, anything else that came up while we were going over this. Um, anything. Going once, going twice. If, if there are no, if there's uh, nothing else to share or ask, but, um, and like Wayne just said in the, in the chat, um, some of this is new, um, but this is, this is really just providing detail about what we're gonna be talking about the next few weeks. So, uh, so if, if any of this seems daunting, uh, don't, you know, don't fret yet, this is, uh, this is what we're going to be spending multiple weeks on. So with that, let's go ahead and uh, and pull up the next set of slides. I'm going to stop share here. Let's see. The next set of slides is just a short set on some of the details of Python, which are not necessarily coding specific, but are good things to know moving forward, just aspects of the language which will, which will inevitably come up 
if you uh, if you build something of substantial size. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and share and share screen now. And just to uh, clarify again, is everyone seeing the title slide saying the context of Python? Awesome. Thank you, Maria. So, uh, so I detailed this set of slides, the context of Python, uh, because what we're really going to be talking about is Python uh, in comparison to other programming languages. Uh, and I'm going to use the, uh, the C and C++ derived languages as, as kind of a, an example of other languages here. Uh, so for those of you who, who haven't coded in Python here, you know, according to the answers on the survey, C or C++ uh, was kind of the popular alternative if you had coded before. And I think that's a remnant of, uh, of OSU's uh, computer science department's course catalog. As I understand it, the introduction to computer science class is, uh, is taught in C++. Uh, I've also heard of a Java or maybe Java, JavaScript uh, introductory course, but, uh, but at least from uh, from you guys, that was uh, uh, C++ was the alternative language there. So the objectives for this set of slides, which is just uh, just a handful of them, is uh, Python in comparison to other languages that you may have seen before. Uh, what we mean when we talk about things like the Python interpreter and the Python model and the data model of the Python language itself, and what we mean when we say weak versus strong typing of variables in a given language. Uh, those of you that are pure Python developers, this, uh, this may or may not be a new, a new thing to you. Um, and those of you that have uh, coded in C or C++, um, it will hopefully lend a lot of insight into why Python code looks the way it does if you've seen it before. So Python is an interpreted language whereas languages like C++ are compiled languages. The difference is how the code gets translated to little zeros and ones. You know, computers run in binary. Uh, everything has to get, get translated into binary at some point. The real difference between interpreted languages and compiled languages is just when that happens. Uh, Python, being an interpreted language, that means that code is translated into machine language or binary as it runs. Whereas a language like C++ is first compiled, which is really just fancy speak for taking uh, text and translating it into binary or machine language, something that the computer can run. And then it is that executable or that file that chunk of gibberish which came out of the compiler, which is actually RAM as opposed to the code that you wrote. So there is always a trade-off in choosing between interpreted versus compiled languages. The interpreted language like Python is very easy to write uh, in comparison to C or C++, which is difficult. C++ specifically has one of the most notoriously steep learning curves uh, in pretty much any um, uh, any language that is uh, publicly available, at least. Um, I've heard a lot of criticism, you know, on that note, I've heard a lot of criticisms of OSU's CS department in choosing to run the introductory course in C++, sort of like uh, dumping someone who doesn't know how to swim right in the deep end of the pool. Um, but I'm sure they have their reasons. The general idea and the bottom line here for what we are doing is that Python is easy to write, C and C++ is not. The trade-off though, is that Python is slow, whereas the C-derived languages and other compiled languages as well are very fast. Um, I write code in both Python and C, that's not C++, the original C uh, implementation. And um, in practice, I've found that a factor, factors of 100 to 1,000 in speed up are very typical when you write the same program between Python and C. C, there is just no comparison uh, between Python and C. You know, C. Python is a turtle and C is Usain Bolt when it 
comes to uh, the, when it comes to execution speed. Uh, one thing that uh, just a kind of a side that you guys might come into or encounter if you decide to branch out to other languages or decide that it, find that it is necessary. Python's use of white space as syntax is uh, is not shared by other languages. And a lot of very renowned software engineers, computer scientists, developers at large, actually criticize it for this. Um, if, if you have not coded in Python before, um, the if statements, loops, structures, things like this, they are uh, at the body is actually determined by the indentation level. So if you have a for loop, the body of the for loop has one indentation level, one tab. Uh, in, um, uh, starting on the line following the for loop. So you'd have say for or while, whatever, and then the next line would have one extra tab character. Uh, and then the line after that also one extra tab character until the end of the loop. And that is this, and that there is this is the uh, is some details on the syntax of how to do that. Uh, other languages do not share that aspect. C and C use curly brackets. Um, I I can't speak to other languages because Python and C are are my are basically languages that I code in, uh, and that's where my area of expertise is. Uh, but uh, just know going forward that if you do switch, that's not going to be the same in other languages. Uh, I want to stop here quick and just ask, are there any questions thus far? Any comments, concerns, anything? All right. Um, so moving on. Uh, the Python interpreter. When we say what, when we say the Python interpreter, what we mean is really the program which runs the code that you've written in Python. This contrasts from the language in that this is what you're actually running uh, and what actually makes Python go uh, and and actually do something in your computer. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is kind of in, somewhat inception compared to the previous slide. But Python is written in C. The Python Foundation's distribution and their implementation of the Python language is, is a program whose source code is written in C, not C++, the original C uh, distribution. So what that means is there is a source code written in C, which is then compiled. And so there is this machine language uh, binary executable somewhere in, in your computer, which reads Python code and makes decisions on what to do based on the Python code that you write. Uh, one, one, the second bullet point here I want to call out specifically, um, if, if you are working on a project which has maybe it's very data intensive or, uh, or is, you know, takes a lot of computing time, uh, what that means is you can make Python and C talk to each other really easily. A lot of the tools for doing so with, with other languages have, uh, you know, people have developed publicly available tools to do that. But, uh, but Python and C are very closely related. And, uh, and, that is always, uh, and that is always an option. Like I said, we won't be talking about C extensions here because that is quite advanced uh, and obviously requires a, a, pr a pretty in-depth knowledge of the C programming languages to begin with before you even... Uh, before you even think about making a C extension in Python. Uh, but if there is anyone in here who, uh, who finds that that's something that could be a necessary component of their project, uh, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to help you pick up some of those, uh, some of those skills. Uh, there is a footnote on Python being written in C, just a note, there are other implementations of Python, though they are not developed by the Python Foundation themselves. Uh, there, there is specifically a a Fortran implementation of Python. I, I am not sure who has. Uh, I'm not. Sh I'm not sure off the top of my head who or what what company uh, produces that implementation. But C Python is the standard 
and uh, and that means that for the most part, uh, if if you want to write a C extension in Python, it's uh, it's that is the standard, and the standard implementation of Python is uh, is the C implementation. The next slide is uh, is going to be quite important moving forward uh, in this in this boot camp. Uh, the Python model, uh, sometimes referred to as just the data model uh, of Python, is that everything is an object. And this is going to come back up again when we talk about object-oriented programming, obviously, uh, and that's next week. Um, so here in Python, everything you do is uh, everything you do is working with objects, whether or not you knew it this far. And an object uh, is anything which has attributes, properties, functionality. And like I said, again, we're going to be talking about this again next week. But, uh, but everything you touch in Python, be it strings, integers, uh, floating point numbers, functions, they're all objects. And the implementation of Python written in C, that algorithm uh, treats everything as an abstraction called a pi object. Uh, so uh, integers, you know, pi, there's integers, floats, like I said, everything. It is just a particular instance of an object which is, uh, which is implemented in C and its name is pi object. Uh, so some of the attributes, you know, just to kind of put a little more detail to this, um, an integer is a pi object because it has you know, it has an attribute, which is the actual value of the integer. It has an attribute, which is its type identifier, which, which, note, which denotes it as an integer and tells the implementation of Python to treat it as an integer. Uh, these, these are all aspects which will become clearer moving forward, especially next week. But, uh, but the bottom line is that um, object-oriented programming, uh, not every language is an object-oriented language. Python, however, is about as object-oriented as it gets because literally everything you touch is an object. So that's, uh, that is the thing to just kind of make a note of and just kind of keep in your back pocket and just say, okay, I'm going to be learning object-oriented programming soon. I've actually been working with them all along. Uh, so there will be more clarity coming uh, later in this boot camp uh, insofar as uh, how deep this really runs. Uh, and uh, and how it impacts code written in Python. The final point of this uh, of this set of slides is the weak versus strong typing uh, aspect. So Python is an example of a weakly typed language. What that means is that I can just simply say x equals three. It, I don't have to declare a type at all. This contrasts to C or C++, which as I understand it, a lot of you have experience in, in that if I were to declare an integer whose value is three, I have to write this line instead, int x equals three. I have to first tell the computer that x is an integer, whereas Python just knows that. Um, and you can change that in Python. You could say x equals 3.1, and its type will change. It will then become a float. Um, you could also say x equals this string example in quotes, and it will change it to a string. Um, in, in C or C++ or any strongly typed language, you can't change that. As soon as you say int x, x is an integer, and it will stay an integer. If I were to say x equals 3.1, or x equals quote example, um, you will get an error. It um, it may vary from language to language. I don't know without actually testing it if that would be a compiler error or an error that would get thrown when you tried to run the code. Uh, but regardless, that uh, that code would not run, and it would throw an error, uh, and it would throw an error at you. So, uh, so those of you who are coming from say the C or C plus plus introductory course. Uh, you don't have to do you don't have to do this in Python. Uh, in, in all actuality, this is uh, uh, this is the recommended syntax, and, uh, and pretty much everyone who uses Python will uh, just uh, uh, 
uh, will use this construction. Uh, are there any questions about this? No. Some people uh, coming from other languages uh, are a little confused when they see weak typing for the first time. So I want to stop for, for a second and just uh, take questions again. All right. Uh, well, we don't have, uh, I didn't get anything in the chat. No one spoke up at least. Uh, so we'll go ahead and move to the, uh, the summary slide. These are kind of the key points just to kind of keep in mind, uh, and some of which will come up uh, at other points throughout this boot camp. The first of which is that Python, it's, the, it's an interpreted language uh, that makes it easy to write, but it is slow. Uh, one aspect of it being slow is the fact that it is indeed an interpreted language. Another thing that, make, that makes it slow is, uh, is its data model. It makes it relatively data intensive. Uh, you know, treating everything as an object means that everything has attributes and that takes up data in your computer uh, and that slows down your computer. Um, so there are various things that make Python slow, uh, only one of which is the, uh, is the fact that it is interpreted. Uh, the Python interpreter is just a uh, is just a name that people have attached to the program that actually runs the code you've written. So when it, when people say the Python interpreter, they're specifically referring uh, to that program, not just uh, you know not necessarily the language, but uh, but specifically what runs it. Uh, and the Python model is just this statement that everything is an object, and seriously, uh, like they mean it when they say everything, everything down to integers. Uh, even is, is an object. And, uh, and weak typing, uh, you should just know that Python is going to keep track of your data types for you. You don't have to tell it that a number is an integer. Uh, you don't have to tell it that a number is a float. Uh, but that said, things like typecasting from other languages are, re are retained in Python. And, and, uh, and how to do that will come up on Wednesday. Uh, so you don't have no power over your over the types of your variables. Uh, just if you do need a specific variable type, you have to tell Python. Uh, just like in C or C++, when you would say int x, except you only have to say int when you really mean it. You need Python to understand uh, a given a given type of variable. All right. Any other questions thus far? Comments, concerns, anything. If uh, if not, um, we are now one hour in. So one uh, one thing I would like to do throughout this boot camp is to kind of break things up into hour increments. So every uh, every hour or approximately uh, thereof, when we reach some uh, stopping point, let's uh, take five minutes or so, uh, use the restroom, grab a snack, stretch, anything you might need to do. Um, so let's reconvene in just a few minutes at uh, around 205, 206 or so. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, in the meantime, just uh, Take a breather, relax for a bit, and we'll come back with uh, with our comprehensive terminal review and the basics of the terminal. All right. See you guys in a few minutes. All right. Is everyone seeing the uh, the inch, the title slide here? The terminal. Awesome. Thank you. So. This is now diving into the material of the boot camp. So, uh, welcome to basic training, everyone. Um, and you know, you don't have to call me uh, Sergeant James, but you can if you want to. Uh, so, I chose to cover the terminal uh, today uh, and some of the tools that you guys will need uh, specifically to give you. Uh, a day or two to get all of those things set before we actually start the, the, uh, the, the Python portion of this. So today, rather than talking about Python specifically, like I said, we're going to be talking about 
uh, a bash terminal. And I will talk about, uh, about Windows terminals, the things you will see in Windows uh, as best I can. Uh, but, uh, but one of the things that we'll discuss in here is that if you, if you are an astronomer, you, you should learn the bash terminal for reasons which will come up here uh, in these slides. So to answer the question which came up earlier, just what is a terminal? And really all it is, like Python, bash is an interpreted language. It, uh, it takes in strings, just simple commands that you give it, uh, and then uh, reads that command, says, what do you want me to do? And then, uh, and then either says, I don't know what this means, or does uh, what does the command you, did, you just entered. Uh, so if you are new to a terminal, you should think of this like a finder window. It's, uh, it's, it becomes relatively intuitive if you think of it like that. It is. It really is the same interface. You're just looking at, uh, or uh, sorry, it really is just a different interface on the same data. You're really just looking at the files that are within your computer and the directories and, and how they're organized. Um, it's just it's just delivered in a slightly different way. Uh, there are things that the terminal actually is is much better for than say a Finder window uh, on. Or the equivalent thereof on Windows, uh, and uh, and some of you may find as you get better and better with the terminal that uh, that some things you genuinely do prefer to do in the terminal because they're just short one-line commands that may take much longer in a Finder window. Uh, so the disclaimer here, which I hinted at earlier, is that not every terminal is the same. Uh, they pretty much all have the same capabilities, and you can do more or less the same things in all of them, except if you don't have a Unix terminal, uh, which is probably Bash, uh, uh, then uh, uh, then you, you might find some difficult you know you might find some difficulties if uh, in in learning uh, in in transitioning from one to the other if you have the other. But the point is they don't have the same syntax. Um, they don't all have the same syntax. They, they all, like I said, they all do more or less the same thing. But to put some detail to this, uh, pretty much all of the terminal utilities out there fall under one of two categories. They're either Unix-like or, uh, or DOS-like. DOS being DOS, uh, an uh, which is an acronym. I forget what uh, what it stands for, but uh, but basically Linux. And Mac OS are uh, are derived from Unix, and so they have terminal utilities, uh, which are very similar to one another. Uh, that contrasts to the uh, thank you uh, in the chat. Yeah, DOS disk operating system. Thank you. Uh, so that con the contrast there is that if you are running on Windows. That means your OS is derived from DOS uh, and your terminal is derived from DOS. So the syntax is different, but they'll all do more or less the same thing. The problem here is that if you are a Windows user, pretty much all of astronomy uses Linux computers, uh, like pretty much all supercomputing and clustering nowadays is done with, uh, with Linux systems. Uh, but you're not, you know, to, to address the well darn message <laughs> message in the in the chat, um, you're not you're not you know hung out to dry by any means. The problem is just that there are a few extra steps you need to take to get a, a bash terminal up and running. There's and they're all relatively straightforward. Um, the the basic idea is is just uh, Windows has now developed a uh, a subsystem for Linux so that you can run all of this. Uh, you can run all of these types of programs and these commands on Windows, uh, you just have to uh, have to enable it, and uh, and I believe you need the Windows Terminal, which is a relatively new application for that. But uh, in any case, I'm going to drop a link in the chat quick. Uh, this is to a specific page on the Git repository, which just has. 
uh, this summary of some of these tools that we were uh, that we were going over earlier. Um, the you know, a summary of the difference between a text editor and an integrated development environment is in there, uh, as is a uh, as is some details on the Bash terminal. The basic idea there is that if you're running Windows, uh, you just have to uh, upgrade to Windows, a uh, specific version of Windows 10 if you haven't already, uh, and then go through these steps of enabling the Windows subsystem for Linux. Uh, and there's there's a link, there's also a link on this page uh, that should, teach, should, uh, should show you everything you need uh, for how to do that. If anyone has issues doing that, please please speak up. Uh, like I said, you know, part of the whole point of delaying the Python portion of this bootcamp until Wednesday is so that everyone can get this up and running comfortably without uh, without feeling like they're being left behind. So if you're a Windows user, uh, uh, you just have to uh, to make this uh, to make this change. Uh, so a question in the chat from Maria is is how how to you how do you uh, make it use Bash? Um, so as I understand it, there should be an option in like the toolbar at the top that just toggles between different terminals if you are currently using the Windows terminal. Um, I the, the unfortunate aspect of this is I do not have a Windows computer. So when I was compiling all of this, uh, all of these references and materials, I had no way of, of knowing really for sure if they, if they work. So uh, to be fully transparent here, um, I, I have these references, uh, and I can help you get this up and running. But the bottom line is, I do not know if if any of this uh, is out. You know, it could be outdated. I don't know if it 100% if it is going to work until uh, until those of you who are Windows users uh, try this. And if it does, and like I said, if it doesn't work, just reach out to me, and we can talk, and I can help you get uh, get the Bash terminal up and running. Um, if you uh, if you find you have difficulties in doing so. Uh, that said, there are a bunch of resources out there, so uh, it, it in theory shouldn't be that difficult, but often theory and practice are quite different, and as a theorist, uh, that is one of the grudging points of my career. Uh, so if you, uh, if you find that you have issues or uh, uh, just speak up, just please do. Uh, but that said, if, if you are comfortable with PowerShell already, that is perfectly fine. I am not gonna, uh, you know, I'm not gonna require that everyone in here use uh, use one terminal over the other. That's uh, the point is that you just have a terminal that you are comfortable with. So if you are a Windows user and you're comfortable with PowerShell, by all means, continue to do so. Just know that uh, that you will need to know Bash and Linux terminals uh, at some point. Um, it's it's likely that you will use some some supercomputing utilities at some point in your career um, or interactions with, with Linux computers. Those are uh, uh, that is often very excuse me that is often necessary uh, and uh, and so learning Bash is uh, is a is an investment in your career more or less because you will use it at some point. Encounter it, encounter it at some point. And going from DOS to Bash is is something that people have compiled a ton of references for. Like this is here is just one cheat sheet for going back and forth from one to the other. Uh, and and this really just just uh, exemplifies the idea that the two terminals are the same. They just take different commands. There's just different syntax. You know, pretty much every command you can give a Linux terminal has some equivalent in DOS. Um, they can often look very different, but they're all doing the same thing. So, uh, so the rest of these slides pretty much just go through uh, a series of terminal commands to show you some output and what they look like. And, uh, and at the end, finishes with uh, some cool things that you can do that a lot of Astronomers often struggle with, like a bash profile, aliases, environment variables, uh, and uh, and so we'll talk about those at the end. And if you have, uh, and uh, and then we will turn over to exercises. And uh, and the exercises for today uh, are 
just some basic terminal usage. And those of you who are on Windows computers, uh, I encourage you to use that time to uh, to figure out some of these uh, some of these modifications to your terminal environment that uh, that are that I would really encourage you to uh, to get set up. So uh, so I will go ahead and uh, take. A few seconds for questions now. If anyone has comments, questions, or concerns, drop them in the chat, speak up, anything. All right. If there aren't any, if there aren't any questions thus far about uh, what we've so far discussed, which is basically the differences between Mac and Windows. Uh, let's uh, move forward with some of the simple terminal commands that you'll want to know. Uh, the first is PWD. This is uh, stands for Print Working Directory. Um, the the uh, PowerShell equivalent is chdir. This can be very uh, very confusing. To, and I apologize quickly. I see some. I see a question popped up in the chat. Um, I I uh, I can confirm that Ubuntu is a very is probably the most popular Linux subsystem, and uh, and I would encourage you to use Ubuntu if you are enabling a, a Linux subsystem. I would uh, I would go with Ubuntu. It's very popular. There's a lot of resources for it. Uh, so back to the slide now. Um, I want to call out uh, this. Uh, this chdir command in PowerShell may cause some confusion because chdir in uh, in Python is also the name of a function in the OS library which changes directories. So, uh, so in PowerShell, chdir means give me uh, the current directory I'm I'm working with. But in Python, uh, when you import the OS module and call it os.chdir with the same uh, the same name. Uh, that is what you use to actually change directories as opposed to get the one you are currently working in. So an example of PWD is like if you are if you have made some file for this boot camp, let's say you have in your desktop you've got some file for SERP and then some file within that, or sorry, some directory within that named boot camp, uh, running PWD would, would print something like this. Like users, your username, your desktop, uh, your cert file and then your bootcamp folder. It's it's very straightforward. It just tells you uh, the current directory you're in or folder if you're coming from. Uh, if you haven't seen this before and are more used to say finder windows, uh, this is like just getting the full path to the folder that you're in. Uh, CD is uh, is as I understand it the same between the two uh, between the two bash and DOS, which just means change a directory. So if you are in one directory but want to go to another, uh, you use cd to do that. So for example, if, if you are in your home directory and you can then cd to that same path that I just uh, just passed in the previous slide, just with a command and then the relative path to, uh, to that file. So after running that, uh, running this command, and if you run pwd again, it tells you that you're, in, uh, that you're now in this directory where you were last time. Just a couple quick uh, quick notes, some, some easy shorthand if you're doing this. Uh, two dots, one after the other with no spaces in between, just refers to one directory up, so your parent directory. So after, if I were to start in this, uh, in this directory and run cd dot dot, I'd wind up in users Brutus Buckeye desktop SERP, as opposed to uh, the bootcamp directory within that. Uh, and the tilde symbol, uh, which is uh, which is just above your uh, and just to clarify at least on on all computers I've used is just above the tab key uh, with with shift that is always your home directory so you can just do cd tilde and you will uh, and it will take you to uh, to this home directory which is just above your uh, one level above your desktop. Uh, ls is uh, is the list. Uh, or at least that's the mnemonic I've attached to it. And in PowerShell, I believe, the, uh, as I understand it, the equivalent is, uh, is DIR. And all this does is just it tells you it tells you everything that's in uh, the current directory. 
So if you are, say, in your this bootcamp directory again and you run ls, it will tell you uh, all of the directories which are which are contained by this directory, as well as all of the files, which could be anything from Python code to Word documents, PowerPoints, text files, uh, compile. If, if you've got, uh, say, C code in some directory uh, and you compile it, the compiled output may be in there as well. Uh, just whatever is in that file will get uh, will get printed. LS command. Uh, so that's kind of, that's just showing exactly what uh, some example here. Maybe there's in this bootcamp, you downloaded the exercises and slides, and maybe you've got some code that you wrote for uh, for a uh, for one of our exercises. Uh, and then uh, after this, one of, one of the uh, next useful commands is MV which uh, the mnemonic that I've touched that is move. And it's just uh, it's just kind of a convenient coincidence that in PowerShell, I think uh, move is, is the command itself. And the usage for this is, uh, is you move a file or rather rename it uh, to some new name. So the, the old name goes first and the new name goes second. So you'd say uh, move some new file to its new location. Um, so, like, if I have in this uh, in this directory, if I have some file named oldname.py and I want to name it newname.py, this is the this is the usage you would give it. And then, after running ls, you'd see uh, you'd see no file named oldname.py, but you have uh, but you have a file named newname.py, and it and it is exactly the same as it was prior to the move. It's just at a different location. Uh, this is this is worth calling out here that uh, a file's name is specifically its location within the computer. Those, those are, if, if you haven't been told that in the past or you haven't realized it, those are one and the same. Uh, the name of a file, its full path, is exactly uh, its location. You know, the, technically, the full name of a, of a file is all of its, uh, its parent directories up to uh, its name within its own directory. So uh, the name of a file is just simply uh, is just simply where it sits within your hierarchical file file structure. So giving something some new name uh, and and moving it within your computer to a new location, those are exactly the same things. Uh, CP. Is, uh, is how you copy files. And in PowerShell, the equivalent command is just straight up copy. So that is uh, how you would move a file to a new name or, uh, or location, but not destroy the old copy. So this contrasts to MV in that MV actually does destroy the old copy, but, uh, but, cop but CP or copy in Windows does not. So an example of this is if you were to run ls in some directory and you've got maybe some data file, some code, which then maybe produce some output file. And maybe you want to work with a copy of the output file rather than a result, uh, rather than the, uh, than the result.out file for some reason. Uh, so you run a cp command and then you have essentially two of the same file. You've got now copy.out and result.out. And both are there. Both will be exactly the same as one another. Um, and the advantage to this is maybe you don't want to accidentally run code uh, which could, uh, which might destroy some of the formatting in here. You know, this, if if you're, if you're say a TA at any point, one of the things we do as TAs is when we get copies of answers to file to tests from the testing center, is we uh, is we copy that file. To a new location, so that we always have, uh, so that we always have the version that was given to us from the testing center, and uh, and that's uh, that is easily achieved just with the CP command. Uh, so this is useful in the ca in cases where you want to make sure that there is a safe copy of your code somewhere, uh, somewhere within your system. Uh, if you want to make a new directory, the command that you should give uh, is mkdir or make directory. Uh, and as I as I understand, it's the same command on PowerShell and Windows. So 
This is this is essentially the same as clicking new folder in a finder window. If you're if you're new to uh, if you're new to the terminal, MKDIR is essentially just uh, is uh, is really what new folder is running under the hood. It's running a make dear command to produce that uh, to produce the new directory that you want. So an example of this is if if I'm in again if I'm in this bootcamp directory that uh, some of you may have uh, have already made. Uh, if I just run a make dear command and create some example directory, then it's it's there as soon as you run that command. Very simple. Uh, next is RM, and I think the equivalent of this in PowerShell is del. This is how you uh, this is how you delete files, but you want to be careful with RM. Always, you know, always take a second before you and just read an rm command before you hit enter and run it because rm it doesn't move a file to your trash uh, rm deletes a file from your system memory as soon as you rm a file it is gone unless you can get it back somehow it's gone um, there i think you know i've uh, as i understand it there's ways to potentially recover something that was rm by diving deep, deep, deep into the system memory, but uh, but that requires much, you know, a much deeper knowledge of CS and operating systems and uh, and kernel source code that I don't know that uh, that I personally at least am not aware of. So uh, the the disclaimer here is to just you know, take a second before you run an RM command because if it's if you're RMing something that you might potentially need in the future. Um, you you want to be sure that you want to that you want to, that that is something that you really want to delete and not see again in the future. So uh, one example of this is like if I run ls in some directory and I've got two two files that are good code but one that is bad and it could be bad for any number of reasons. Maybe it runs it raises an error that you don't understand and you have other code that uh, that works and the bad one. Uh, and the bad one doesn't, uh, you can just run rm and then the name of the file and it's gone. And you never have to think about it again. Uh, but like I said, you know, I can't stress this enough. Be careful with, uh, with rm. You can, uh, you can really, can really shoot yourself in the foot sometimes if you, if you remove too many files. So the, perhaps one of the most useful terminal commands that you, uh, that you can uh, use is is the man command, uh, and as I understand it in PowerShell, this is just some command followed by a slash and an exclamation point. But what this does is it pulls up documentation. Man is short for manual. So if you're if you're wanting to uh, find out, say, uh, what extra commands you can give some terminal command. Uh, uh, man is a good first place to look because it has all of the documentation on all of these commands. So, say man ls, man mp, man pwd will tell you uh, will tell you all of the extra options that you can uh, flag these terminal commands with to get uh, to get some desired effect. Uh, one useful aspect of the terminal, which you might find, is uh, is where the terminal shines over some finder window and where you know performing some action on all files of some given extension uh, becomes easier in the terminal is that the an asterisk always refers to uh, to all the files in a given directory and you can specify and you know some extra piece of information with the asterisk uh, to refer to files with some format uh, so an example here is that uh, if, in, if in some directory I have files named some data.dat, some code.py, and some output.out, out. the idea is maybe that you know maybe these are files that hold some data, some source code that you wrote, and maybe the output of that of that code. Um, if you if you run ls asterisk.py with no space in between, uh, that will list all of the files with a .py extension. Um, so then you can pass also rm asterisk dot say whatever to remove all of the files of some extension. Like if if you want to get rid of all of the files that have 
a dot out extension or uh, or maybe you know dot png like you're cleaning some directory of output and uh, and plots you can run rm asterisk dot out uh, and that will remove all of the files with the dot out extension uh, same with asterisk dot png you can also specify prefixes so if i were to run ls sum asterisk and no space between sum and the asterisk uh, every file in this directory fits that uh, fits that bill. That would list every file that just starts with the characters S O M E, uh, and that is pretty much everything in this directory. So that's uh, that is how you uh, perform uh, relatively simple actions, which may uh, which may take a lot of of pointing and clicking in a finder window, uh, but are actually just simple one liners. In uh, in a terminal, uh, and that may be where you guys find that the terminal is uh, is a little easier than uh, uh, than a finder window. So the next uh, the next few slides there's there's five slides left, but they're not about the simple terminal commands. They get into some more of the details on bash profiles and aliases and environment variables. Uh, so I want to stop here and take ten seconds again uh, and just uh, solicit questions, any comments, concerns, questions, anything. All right, uh, going once, going twice. All right, let's move on. Um, so, uh, one useful tool. In using a bash terminal is uh, is your bash profile. Um, this could be, uh, and there are a couple files which you know you don't have to do the bash profile specifically. You know, and another another place you could put this is your bash rc. Um, so these are files at with a very specific name. Uh, these are in your home directory, and then. Uh, and immediate, immediately, the first character is a period, uh, then bash, either bash underscore profile or bash RC. Um, you, can, you can choose to put these, uh, these commands in either file. You can spread them out across both if you like. Uh, but the, the bottom line is that these are files where your computer looks uh, for some, some specific things, specifically uh, the environment variables, the aliases, modifications to your path or Python path which we'll get to in, in a second. Um, there's, there's, if these files exist already, what, what probably is in there is some gibberish that's going to be used by Anaconda. Um, and, uh, and you can just leave that as, as is. I would, you know, don't, you know, if you modify it, then Anaconda, then Anaconda might have some issues. So if there are, if are any contents in these files, just leave them alone. You can add things to those files, but uh, but just don't touch those few lines, any uh, any lines that are already there, because they're probably there uh, for a reason. Uh, and just a disclaimer, if you add anything to these files or even delete anything, um, typically you need to run this command uh, source uh, tilde slash dot bash underscore profile or or uh, or bash rc if that's where the uh, where the where these commands are. Uh, you would need to do that before your changes can take effect, or or you can just restart the terminal, uh, whichever uh, whichever is easiest. If you are deleting, uh, if you are deleting aliases or environment variables, you know if anything was removed from these files, uh, you will have to restart the terminal rather than running uh, this source command. The the source command will only add uh, new aliases, new environment variables, new path or Python path. But if you uh, if you delete any of them from those files, they will still be there until you restart the terminal. So the the Windows equivalent. This is, these are some of the references I was able to compile on uh, on the Bash profile. There is really no standard name to uh, uh, to the PowerShell equivalent, uh, but there are various ways you can uh, treat the same effect. Um, the, or achieve the same effect. Um, you can write a PowerShell file um, and basically uh, run this command in PowerShell 
uh, cmd.exe slash k and then some uh, path to your uh, to your file which is written in PowerShell and as the references tell me, this uh, this will cause this file to run uh, to auto run on startup, um, and this this comes from a uh, this reference comes from a forum with a bunch of other links to documentation. So if this is something that you know, if you if you are deciding to stick with PowerShell, um, this is a link uh, where you can find some other references uh, uh, on setting up some of these things in uh, in PowerShell, but uh, as I mentioned earlier, if you're if you are an astronomer, Bash is a better choice than PowerShell. Um, it will vary field to field. You know, engineering specifically is very Windows dominated. But if you are an astronomer, you are going to overwhelmingly be using Unix-based operating systems. So Linux OSs like Ubuntu, CentOS, which is on the astronomy department. Uh, desktops, uh, Mac OS is also a Unix-based operating system. Uh, and so those terminals are going to be overwhelmingly using Bash. Um, however, uh, like I said, if you are already comfortable with PowerShell, um, then you then by all means continue uh, continue using what you are comfortable with. The bottom line here is that everyone uh, that everyone has a terminal utility that they are comfortable with. Uh, and if and if you aren't comfortable uh, with one or the other yet, uh, Bash is what I would recommend, uh, especially for this for this boot camp. So, uh, moving on now, the next uh, useful piece of terminal usage here is how to set up an alias. Um, aliases are often just kind of quality of life. Uh, modifications to your terminal. This is just how you make a new terminal command out of other terminal commands. Um, so you can create one. Uh, this I realize this is a typo on the slide. This is supposed to be one, not on. So you can you can create one just uh, independent of your Bash profile, but it will be lost as soon as you restart the Bash pro, uh, your terminal. Um, so putting them putting these alias declarations into your bash profile or your bash RC will make an alias uh, permanent so that it uh, is created every time you can launch your terminal. So some, some examples here are um, you know, eight, maybe in some directory, you've got some plotting script. Uh, so you make an alias make plot, which runs the plotting script. And maybe there are command line arguments that it takes. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's complicated. You can string all of those commands together into an alias and call it make plot, and then just running make plot and hitting enter in the terminal will uh, uh, will execute all of those commands. Uh, uh, I and and several and several other um, astronomers I know who uh, who are Python aficionados have alias their ls command to something other. Uh, uh, and now use some derivative of ls. I personally have alias uh, the command lc to ls-lha. So it prints a little more than an ls command. It also gives you uh, things like the read, write, and execute permissions on files. It gives you their, uh, their sizes in, uh, in kilobytes, megabytes. Uh, it gives you their, the date of last modified. Uh, so that it gives you a little more information than just an ls command, and uh, and all of these flags again, if you were to you know if you wanted a reference on what flags you uh, you could pass ls, uh, that would be in the man page for uh, for ls. So you type man ls, and it will pull up the manual entry for ls, which will figure out uh, all the all the kinds of things you can give that command to uh, to customize uh, how you view your file structure and your directory. And hierarchical organization of your computer system. Uh, you can also alias certain uh, certain directories to a cd command. So, like if you wanted to uh, make some alias that will always take you to, say, the, some directory that you've made for for your work with SERP this summer, and maybe that's in your desktop, and you have some file named SERP. You can say cd home directory desktop SERP and call that. Alias SERP, then running you know, in all low uh, in all lowercase here, 
you type S U R P, hit enter. Um, as soon as as soon as that is in your Bash profile and you have ran either source Bash profile or restarted the terminal, uh, that command will then always take you to that directory. Uh, I've I've set up a few of those commands in the past as well. They're very useful to not have to, uh, you know, change many many directories uh, multiple times uh, and be able to just not even think about it and just say, you know, sir, and then you're and then you're at some directory. Environment variables are uh, particularly useful because you can access them in Python, uh, but also if you work with any particularly legacy code at any point, which may be written in C, C++, Fortran. You know, in, a, in astronomy, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of legacy code. I have worked with legacy code as well. Um, sometimes, uh, sometimes they require a very specific environment variable. Uh, sometimes you have to set up a couple of them in order for, uh, in order for some program to run properly. So what environment variables are is they're really just uh, variables that are global to your shell script. They can be accessed anywhere, anytime, uh, and, by, and by really any program with access to the OS, to the, oper the operating system or your terminal. So, and that includes Python. So you can kind of customize your, uh, your workspace a little bit by setting up some of these environment variables if you want to. Um, and you can even use environment variables in aliases as well. So uh, one example of this, if, if I were to, say, uh, set up an environment variable which pointed to uh, a, a SERP directory where I have uh, put all of my code for, uh, for SERP this summer, um, the syntax I would say is export SERP directory, and it doesn't have to be in all caps, but uh, but conventionally, environment variables are in all caps. That's just kind of a naming convention, but you can you can give them lowercase names if you'd like. Uh, these will be accessible in Python via this os.environ uh, variable. So OS is a standard library uh, Python module. When you launch Python, you can just say import OS, and, uh, and it will import uh, the operating system uh, the operating system utilities and os.environ is a dictionary uh, of all of your environment variables. So uh, if you haven't coded in Python before, or if you do not know what a dictionary is, uh, that will come up on, on Wednesday. We'll be talking about, about dictionaries. Uh, so environment variables, a, there is a very specific environment variable, which will probably be useful to many people, or if you are an astronomer who uh, has encountered these in the past and hasn't really uh, seen them before, your path and your Python path, specifically those two variables in all caps, uh, often comes up and, uh, and, and sometimes people don't really know what this refers to or how to add directories to their path or Python path permanently. Uh, and knowing how to do this is, is actually just a very specific application of environment variables, path and Python path are directories where your computer looks for executables or code. Uh, so um, one example of a directory that is on your path is the site packages directory where all of NumPy and Matplotlib, SciPy, all these uh, packages which are part of Anaconda are in a directory which is on your path. Uh, and that's how Python knows to uh, knows to look there. So, uh, so you can make your computer find code, or you can. This is a way to essentially put code in a specific directory, and then if you put that directory onto either your path or Python path, you can import it from anywhere in your computer, uh, and that and that's very useful. You know, maybe you find yourself writing the same code, you know, a hundred times in every notebook or every every file. You find yourself writing this the same, you know, the same get bin number function or uh, or the same uh, or the same array manipulation function. Uh, if you find yourself doing that, one thing you can do is put it 
in some text file that is uh, is on uh, is on your path or Python path, rather it's in a directory which is on your path or Python path, and you can and you can just import it. You don't have to write it again. Uh, so this is very useful in uh, in efficiently writing code. You can set up uh, you can set up files in a specific location so that you don't have to continue writing the same thing over and over again. So this looks similar to uh, to the environment variables on the previous page. They have the same export some name equals whatever it may be command, uh, except here uh, there is a colon at the end, and then this dollar sign all caps Python path. So I wanted to to offer bonus, you know, one million brownie points to anyone who can tell me why Python path shows up on its own uh, on its own assignment. So I'll, I'll leave a good ten or twenty seconds here if anyone wants to speak up and say why they think it might it might be that way. Any and if there are any grad students, faculty, postdocs, anyone in here who has modified their path or Python path before uh, and knows the answer to this, feel free to speak up. And there you have it. It's in the chat. Thank you, Wayne. So what that does is- And Jerry. Sorry? And Jerry. And Jerry, yes. Ah, yes, thank you, Jim. Yes, Jerry and Wayne. The, uh, the reference to Python path on the very end is, uh, is an append function, more or less. If you've worked with lists in Python before, uh, the append function is just how you add an element to the end. So this is really, and that's not uh, that's not specific to Python lists. So uh, some of you in here may have heard that word before. It just uh, it adds this directory to your Python path that says, okay, Python path equals this directory, and then anything that was there before. Your Python path might not be, uh, you know, it might not be initialized. If it's if it's if you haven't assigned a Python path yet, then Python path is blank. But if it is not blank, then if I were to just say export Python path equals this directory and not include it on the end here, then you have just wiped out every directory that was previously there. So obviously that is not the desired effect. That is going to remove code from your Python path and may cause import errors, which may seem super confusing because now suddenly you don't know why your code isn't getting imported. Uh, so it is, it's important that if you say, if you want to modify your Python path, uh, you say export Python path equals, and then whatever directory uh, you want to be on your Python path, and then, uh, and then a colon, all directories on here have to be separated by a colon, and then you reference uh, the old Python path with this dollar sign, uh, like so. And, uh, and if you're modifying your path instead of your Python path, uh, the syntax is the same. You just, you just don't have uh, Python just export path equals and then the directory and then dollar sign path, and that's it. Uh, so that is the end of this set of slides.